today is Friday, August 9th, 2019. My name is Susan Gerhard, and I'm proud to be here today with a gentleman that I hired at Defense Intelligence Agency. This is Greg Elder, DIA's Chief Historian. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be here. We're glad you're here. So we've got a lot to talk about in a short period of time. First, what is DIA? And, and I was telling you earlier, when I was working in personnel, a guy called up one time and, and said, I always wanted to work at Denver International Airport, but that's not what DIA is. No, so the Defense Intelligence Agency is the Department of Defense's premier all-source uh, intelligence agency, basically uh, doing all-source analysis for the Department of Defense, supporting a whole range of missions. We first started out uh, when DI began in 1961 with roughly 12 official chartered missions. We have nearly 100 chartered missions now, overseeing a wide range of, of scientific, like me measurement and signatures intelligence and medical intelligence to so operational support. So when you say support. all source intelligence, that means coming from many sources, wherever we can get the information. Truly, that's the case, from what we would call spies, uh, human intelligence, uh, signals intelligence, breaking communications and, and taking information from adversary communications, uh, geospatial intelligence, which is imagery from above, open source, the press, and so on. So wherever you can get information that's going to enable our mission to be able to inform decision makers, and decision makers being the Secretary of Defense, the President, or uh, the soldier on the ground who has to worry about what's around the next corner, um, supporting their ability to make decisions effectively, that's really what we're there to do. And that's really part of DIA's, I won't use the term mission statement, but that we do support the soldier on the ground. That's our, that's our true goal, to keep that person safe and coming back. Absolutely. So we started out really concerned about what we would call strategic level intelligence, the high level thing, because the Soviet Union at the time, we had to have a better military understanding um, of their overall comprehensive military capability. But as we became more and more uh, focused and, and more and more time had to be spent on actually supporting our folks on the ground, like in Vietnam, um, through the Goldwater Nichols Act, DIA became an official combat support agency so that we have that true dual responsibility of supporting senior policymakers and decision makers about what to do next, right. um, but also truly supporting the soldier in, on the ground right. or at sea or in the air. We have a short video to show you that comes from DIA's website, www.dia.mil. There's lots of information there, but this is a video that explains the agency quickly, more quickly than probably we would. Right. <laughs> so let's run that video, if we would, please. Freedom, diversity, equality, democracy, prosperity, community, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Principles that are the heart of our country. Principles that the Defense Intelligence Agency is committed to safeguarding. Breaking new details about North Korea's missile launch. Russia test firing its new intercontinental ballistic missile nicknamed Satan-2. The international situation is the most complex and demanding that I have seen in all my years of service. Now Iran is expanding its military operations inside Syria. China is increasingly flexing its military muscle. The U.S. is now confronted with simultaneous challenges in Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and of course violent extremism. New propaganda videos from ISIS appear to show armed drones dropping explosives on troops. From U.S. businesses to the federal government to state and local governments, we are under cyber attack. Russian-backed propaganda spread to millions of Americans. Russia appears to have figured out how to crash a power grid with a click. Two-year multi-stage effort by Russian government hackers. Countries like China are actively testing anti-satellite weapons. You can't armor a satellite the way you would a tank. The stakes are immeasurable, not just for the American military, but for our way of life. Our potential adversaries have not been waiting around. They've been studying us. They're innovating and modernizing faster than we are. Our competitors are working to develop more advanced technologies, which pose an increasing challenge to our warfighters, our decision makers, and the intelligence community. We gotta be more efficient. We gotta be more lethal. We are the defense and defense intelligence. 
DIA is ready at a moment's notice to respond to these global challenges that threaten Americans and our way of life. Providing unparalleled intelligence expertise, knowledge and technological capability to leaders at all levels of the U.S. military and government. Our mission is to provide all source intelligence on foreign military capabilities and operating environments. DIA's intelligence analysis is critical to understanding and deterring threats. From foreign military capabilities and weapon systems to cyber threats, medical and health emergencies, hidden underground facilities, and terrorism, DIA officers are stationed around the world devoted to understanding the global environment. Their first-hand insights guide us in pursuit of our most difficult targets. From missile tests to biological sensors, from cell phone extractions to biometric exploitation, DIA provides special tools and innovative technology to provide critical insight where other collection methods cannot. With a presence in over 140 countries, we provide intelligence support and classified information systems from the Oval Office to deployed forces on the ground. We have taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We speak truth to power and safeguard the information with which we have been entrusted. We do this to protect the freedoms of all Americans, our allies, and future generations around the world. Committed to excellence in defense of the nation, D-I-A. Thank you. That's a wonderful video. Our, our in-house folks did a great job with that. So the question that I most often ask is, what's the difference between DIA and CIA? So the, the main difference is that although CIA established out of World War II um, has a history of supporting uh, Department of Defense and military efforts, the key difference is that we are the, we are the organization dedicated within the Department of Defense to focus on defense-related issues and to really unify all of the different intelligence components of the Department of Defense um, into one voice. And that's really how DIA got started, that joining of all of the somewhat duplicative intelligence efforts that were in the services. Correct. So. In World War II, we had the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which was an incredible intelligence uh, step-up capability from what we had had before World War II. And, and after World War II, uh, the determination was to make it go away because we had the service intelligence organizations, we had the Army and the Navy, and then in 1947, the Air Force. Uh, so we had the service organizations, and then we established CIA. Well, the difficulty there was that um, CIA had a, had a wide range of missions that they were doing outside of the Department of Defense, and then each of the service organizations um, had their own parochial and, and nat nat natural interest to look at. So the sure. Navy is going to look at, well, like, what is the Soviet naval capability? The Air Force is going to look at, so what is the Soviet air capability? And, and what was coming up with was there was not a unified Department of Defense voice there was not a perspective of the overall cumulative threat uh, towards the United States and our allies. Uh, and CIA, um, while providing a voice for that, was not able to provide a unified Department of Defense voice. So we really stood up um, to try to help mitigate some of the problems that we had had in the 1950s, like the bomber gap and the missile gap. So with the bomber gap, we get this sense that the Soviets are building hundreds and hundreds of these sophisticated bombers, and they were very good about um, hiding their limitations and mm -hmm. shortfalls. So one of the things that they did is in one of their air parades or one of their, their military parades over Moscow, they took the same bombers and flew them over the city several times in, in circles so that the folks on the ground looking up would, would go, say, wow, oh, look, look at all these we bombers. Have. Well, they actually had a very, very small bomber force. Well, by the time that Most we of them had, were flying around right there. Right. By the time we had a <clears throat> unified picture of what was happening, um, we had already spent quite a bit of money and spent a lot of focus on, on, on producing our own bomber capability, a much larger capability than what the Soviets had. Uh, the same thing happened again very shortly thereafter at the end of the 1950s um, with missiles where there was a sense that the Soviets were building enormous numbers or were going to be procuring enormous numbers of intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. Uh, and so the, the issue came about and became a major political issue in the, 19, um, in the John F. Kennedy Nixon election where Kennedy, one of the things that he ran on was we have to mitigate this missile gap. 
And in fact, while there was an enormous missile gap, it was actually the opposite of what was being uh, uh, stated within elements of the intelligence community, which was we actually had a, a vastly superior nuclear missile, ballistic missile force. In other words, we needed, we needed people really looking at this stuff and not, not, have, not CIA doing it as one of many things that they were doing. It, exactly. So this all happened under President Kennedy. Yes. And how did, what year was that? So DI was established in 1961, uh, originally with 25 people out of one office in the Pentagon, then we moved to Arlington Hall, and today, today uh, as the video talked about, um, we're in more than 140 countries with more than 16,000 uh, employees. That's amazing. Where are our headquarters? So our headquarters are here in Washington D.C. Uh, here in Washington D.C. But we have uh, we're embedded in in embassies all over the world. Uh, we're in each one of the combatant uh, commands. So if you go to Africom, as you saw in the video, or you go to Southern U.S. Southern Command, uh, U.S. Pacific Command, we're there as well. Wherever there are U.S. military elements deployed, we have a large part of our workforce that deploys overseas so, so, to actually support operations. So DIA is not an office where one gets a job and sits down and gets up thirty years later and and walks off into the sunset. No, in fact, it's it's. A fantastic place to work in terms of the, the 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 opportunities provided you because at any given time nearly half of our workforce is not working at headquarters they're, they're out in the field it's an opportunity to be able to say you can work at a central higher level supporting senior right. customers but then you can also deploy overseas and, and really support our folks in, in, in operational environments. And thanks or, to the major communications that we have now the, all the communications equipment, it doesn't really matter where you are. Right. We have the ability to reach out and talk almost instantly. And that was one of the real revolutions that happened um, in the years right before the Gulf War was, was that transition and being able to actually uh, communicate more effectively uh, almost, almost immediately. Yeah. And it's exciting to do that. I know you've done it. I know I've done it. And it's really, it's really amazing to think I'm sitting here and I'm talking to people in Afghanistan or, or Asia someplace. And Wow, this is really terrific. So, DIA was founded in 1961, and who was the first head of it? So that was General Joseph Carroll, uh, kind of a unique individual. He actually came out of the FBI in World War II, but he was a very good negotiator and and political politically savvy person. And we knew when DI was established that there was going to be some real friction because we're, we effectively took over many of the missions and funding and people from the different service intelligence organizations, and none of them were particularly interested right away in having their missions taken over by this new organization. So we, we had Joseph Carroll come in, who was kind of an outsider coming in, but was mm -hmm. trusted by Secretary of Defense McNamara to be able to come in and speak with a unified voice, because although he was wearing an Air Force uniform, he really didn't come into the military as Air Force or Army or Navy he re or Marines. He really came in um, as an independent actor. So, and, and that's an important point. The DI's leadership is, oh, the director is always military, but not necessarily the same service every time. Right. It rotates. Um, uh, generally, it rotates. Uh, every 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 director who comes in is from a different service. And now, the deputy director for for several generations has been a civilian. Mm -hmm. So that we have that that balance, just as our workforce has. Um, between a, a military and civilian workforce um, working together to be able to provide the best picture. And it's, it's one, of the, one of the places that military people can work that is called a joint assignment because you're not just working with the Army, it's, it's all services working together with civilians. It's kind of a unique opportunity. It, it absolutely is. <clears throat> and to be able to come in and also get the experience for the civilian workforce and working with the military, and then the military working also in an environment with the civilians. It's a good education on both sides, having witnessed it. And, and the civilians, you know, they're your longevity. They're the people who you hope to be there a little bit longer and provide that long-term focus. Whereas the great thing about having having uh, a great military workforce is the people coming in from the field with the actual military experience. And although they're rotating out, you're continuously getting that new blood of people in right. who are staying abreast of what's happening on the military front. It's an interesting mix. So DIA had existed for all of one year 
when a big challenge came up. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, so the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, <coughs> and, and the first thing I would say about the Cuban Missile Crisis is although generally in the end we consider it a success because we, we the U.S. government, identified the ballistic missiles, we were able to work with the Russians to, to take them out, the first part of the Cuban Missile Crisis is actually a real failure. I mean, how, how do missiles, how do ballistic missiles get onto the, the Cuban mainland and start getting deployed without, and nobody without, knew it. without, mm -hmm. no, without being you know, notified? Um, and, and so that was a really effective denial and deception campaign by the Soviets on one hand, but in, our, uh, in another, we, we relied so heavily on overhead imagery of the island. And one of our U-2s had been shot down, and so the president uh, put an end to overflights of Cuba. So we were uh, relying really heavily on immigrants who were coming to the United States and, and, and people telling us what they were seeing. And that is human intelligence. Exactly. Getting information from humans. So we, we, we had started before the overflights ended, started seeing certain surface-to-air missile batteries placed in positions that mirrored in the Soviet Union what they were doing to protect ballistic missile sites. And then we started hearing from... In those from, days, we didn't have the number of satellites looking no. like we had then, so it was much more of a challenge. No, in fact, we had uh, just the Corona satellite. We, we, we did one pass over, over Cuba with, with, a, with a Corona satellite, and it was stormy that day. Oh, no. So, <laughs> so we weren't able to use the, the first uh, satellite. Uh, we also had the first drone of the time, uh, an AQM-34, sitting on the tarmac, but we didn't want to reveal... Um, this new capability we had for something that... So we that, had drones back that far? Yes, we did. Who knew? Uh, and we didn't want, at that time, that was a really sensitive program. Uh, and so we didn't want to reveal what, 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 what at that time was a, really, was a really sensitive program for something that people thought, well, we're just going to fly over Cuba and why, you know, what is the significance of that? So for a period of time, it just happened to be during that window, the worst window that you could imagine, we didn't have U-2 flights over, mm -hmm. over Cuba. We, we, we weren't using our first aerial drones, so we were having to rely on these immigrants who suddenly started talking about these enormous tractor trailers pulling something ah. that could only be right. missiles. So there are three people in DI who were really instrumental in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the first one, one Colonel Wright, um, started seeing, looking at before the U-2 flights ended, where the surface-to-air missile batteries were and where we were seeing these human reports coming up of the movement of these tractor trailers. And he established what was called the San Cristobal Trapezoid, which is an area of Cuba that we said something is happening there. Okay. We really don't know what it is, but something bad is happening. We went to the president, CI and DI went to the president and said, we think something bad is happening. We need at least one aerial overflight. Mm -hmm. And DIA at the time actually had started overseeing many of the U-2 missions, the, the where they should fly, what sure. the mission should be. So we said, we only get one flight, let's fly it over the San Cristobal trapezoid. And so the U-2 went over and take, took the pictures and the famous pictures of the convoy yes. of ballistic missiles derived from, from that flight. So then we went back to the president and said, oh, guess what? We have a problem here. Yeah, And that's, that's an interesting story as well because the pictures that were taken got sent to a, a, an organization called the National Photographic Interpretation Center. And that was a joint CIA-DI-led uh, photographic interpretation organization that now is the is NGA, it the is National whole, Geospatial Agency. A whole different agency. Exactly. At that time, though, what what now is NGA as this huge organization was a CIDI led organization, and and our DI colonel there, Colonel Parker, who was the DI lead, um, was overseeing a set of service mm -hmm. analysts who would eventually become DI themselves, and they found they they found the missiles. So they go to Colonel Parker and they say, "Wow, look at here." He called over. Uh, the, the director, the, the special assistant to Director Carroll in DIA, who was himself a master photographic interpreter named ah. John T. Hughes. John T. Hughes goes to the National Photographic Interpretation Center. They see the missiles. They call, he calls up uh, General Carroll, and they say, we've got to take this to the president and to the Secretary of Defense right now. It's something out of a movie that you would see. They have the handcuff. The rest is history. The handcuff with the bag. Oh, really? And they go to the Deputy Secretary of Defense's house, and uh, uh, he has a party. But he sees that, and the next thing you know, he called Secretary of Defense McNamara, and that spins up the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the rest is history. And the rest is history. So at some point after that, this, this interpreter, John Hughes, was asked to give a briefing on what happened. And tell me about that, how that went. So 
there were, Pre President Kennedy was getting accused of actually, you know, not being honest about the fact that the Cubans were pulling the missiles out. There was real concern that the Cubans actually kept their ballistic missiles there. So John F. Kennedy called um, called DIA to come in and brief him on the status of the of the missiles being pulled out. And John T. Hughes goes over and briefs him. And the president thinks it's such a great briefing that when Hughes leaves and is going back to the Pentagon, he says Hughes needs to get on to get on television and provide a briefing to the American public that the Cubans are actually following right. through. So Hughes gets this call. You're briefing the, wor the, the world tonight on CBS, NBC, and ABC. Um, the president has unilaterally declassified all of the mm -hmm. all of the images for you to show. Because so he thinks the American people should know. Have this. to see. The world needs to that see. That really, yes. So Hughes goes over. It's the the briefing is going to be at the State Department. And he assumes that it's going to be on a screen, kind of like the size of yeah, what we have behind <laughs> us, right? So he goes over there, thinking everything's going to be set up for him to simply point and have an easy briefing. Well, he gets over there, and the screen he's actually briefing on is like 12 feet high by nine feet oh, wide, gosh. and he can't he can't reach to anything, and he's about ready to go on television so and he's going to say up there somewhere yes yeah, somewhere you see that little and so he, he he freaks out and he calls one of his associates and his associate says I've got you covered don't worry about it well here he's looking at his watch he's freaking out and in comes his his uh, uh, friend running into the State Department and what it turned out the only thing he could do he took a fishing pole Go to your right. he took a fishing pole broke it in two taped it together and this is what you would call a 1960s uh, light laser, pointer. laser pointer, right? So on the screen story. behind him, uh -huh. he would simply say, here is a uh -huh. ballistic missile on the screen. And so, you know, the thing is, if you look at that video today, you can still see the taped fishing pole that was used on the first ever televised, officially what was declassified, but really, really sensitive briefing to the and American that, public. I wonder if that video is available on YouTube. It absolutely is. Well, it that is. would be it's something fun to look for. So, so that that incident, really, and that whole thing, brings into play the fact that DIA, over its 58 years now, and I've got the 50-year book here. Every every 10 years or so, they put out a new history book. Uh, in its 58 years, has to be very nimble. They have to be very flexible. I, you and I both know, well, maybe before your time, there was a time when the Soviet Union was everything. Right. And then there came a time after 1990, whatever that was, whatever year, uh, where, oh, the Soviet Union, we don't care so much. So we had a whole army of Soviet analysts who had to be moved to other places, retrained in relative to other parts of the world, and that happens all the time. Right. After 9-11, you were hired and my husband was hired because of 9-11 and we stood up an entire organization called the Joint Intelligence Task Force <laughs> Combating say, Terrorism. It's not how, a short one. How could I have filled that many jobs <laughs> and not put the name together that quickly? But we brought, we brought in four or five hundred people hired just like that. Overnight and who did a terrific job, but that happens all the time. It absolutely does. At the end of the Cold War, there was that perspective of, well, the threat's gone. You know, do we even need these types of intelligence organizations anymore? And then, of course, during that 10-year period after, uh, after, the, after the, the Soviet Union ended, you know, suddenly it's Somalia, it's Bosnia-Herzegovina, it's Haiti. We deployed the U.S. military more times during that decade than in the previous like four decades combined in terms of actually, like people going abroad and having to participate in operations. And I so remember a time when we were going into the Bosnia area that someone physically came to our office and said, what do you have in your records that show that there is anybody in this agency who speaks Serbo-Croatian? Right. And I happened to know a guy, the one guy, the one. because I'd hired him. But that kind of flexibility is really important. Yeah, and, and it's had to it's had to adapt even more. Now we have space. You know, the space threat is increasing. The cyber threat has has grown exponentially. Um, terrorism after 9/11, you know, grew, and yet we still have the need for understanding our conventional uh, adversaries as well. Uh, and then another thing that we do that most people often don't think about is is two areas of one preventing war so we you know you yes. think about we're we're there to to often support military operations um, but our attache program is one of the different mechanisms that we have that's there to facilitate negotiations and discussions with counterparts so that we we, we actually preclude having to go into sort of major conflicts. And another area that I really enjoy talking to people about and telling them that we do is, 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 is actually really saving lives through something called medical intelligence. Yes. Um, which which uh, 
we, we oversee uh, that, that mission. And, and we, there's a separate location for the Armed Forces Medical Intelligence Center, which is part of DIA, correct? Or is it right. the Army's? It's called AFMIC, well, Armed was. Forces. Now it's the National Center for oh, Medical of course, Intelligence. Of you know, I, I left two weeks ago changes. and it's changed, yes. Um, yeah, and so, so here's an organization that has to look at the environments that, that we operate in and threats to our, to our health and safety. In the Civil War, more people died to disease than to bullets. Yes. At the end of World War I, we had the Spanish flu, uh, influenza, which killed many, many, many more times than all the people who died in World War I in combat. Uh, and so we have to understand the medical environment out there and the threat as well. So when the H1N1 pandemic began in 2009, uh, one of the things that, that, that our agency was really out ahead of was in tracking the transition from what was just a regular, looked like a regular annual flu to something that was truly a pandemic. Right. And because our job is warning, getting out in front of the threat, um, we were able to put out a pandemic warning before the World Health Organization, uh, before other other elements of governments who, who have to wait till they have definitive, absolute proof. We're out there for warning. So by getting ahead of that, we were enabling uh, policymakers to start vaccine programs, mm -hmm. to start thinking about how to um, contain the expansion or the spread of this threat. And, and as a result of that, of course, you never know how many lives you save, but we probably saved in the tens or hundreds of thousands well, of I'm lives sure. by getting out ahead of that type of threat. So what kinds of people does DIA hire? I mean, I, I know this answer because I, I worked. Yeah, with, you would know. I, I did some <laughs> recruiting, but, but where do we get the, the employees from DIA? Who, are they, are they a specific college major that is best? I, I know we have a variety of things going on. You know, the fantastic thing about where we work is if you can think of a career field, if you can think of an expertise, we really have to cover it. We have economists, we have economists, we have people, we have scientists who, who, who look at, for instance, ground vibrations and ground sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we have political scientists, but we have lawyers. We, we have uh, people in administrative fields, um, linguists. And of course the, our military experts. Our, our military experts coming, but linguists, the ability to, to say at any given time anywhere in the world, we have to have somebody who can go there right. and speak that language. So, you know, the great thing that I tell people and young, younger people when I go to high schools, for instance, is find, find something you really enjoy doing and then and then there's there's a place for you generally you in the intelligence community and particularly with our agency and for those of you watching who have grandchildren who may be thinking about careers and job hunting looking at dia looking at our website www.dia.mil maybe something they look at and go man maybe i'd like to look at that and we do have a very fine internship program that helps people learn greg we're out of time but i have one more question for you sure. what makes you proud to be a dia employee I'll tell you, I love coming to work every day and doing something that I know really, really matters. Uh, I came to DI shortly after 9-11 and filled a position where I was warning and providing security for our people and our allies from a real threat. And, yeah. and that going to bed every night, despite the concern and the worries that tomorrow you're going to wake up and find something bad happen. That's right. Going to bed every night also, though, knowing that you're doing something that's very meaningful for our country, protecting our people and our service members uh, is really something that uh, it's proud to be, to, to, to take a part in. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I had the same pride.